that's Jessica Sorrell, um, who is a uh, uh, second year graduate student, right? Or actually fourth year. I just need to update fourth my year. website. <laughs> All right, sounds good. A fourth year graduate student at uh, UCSD with uh, Daniela Michancho. And, uh, and she'll, she'll tell us about ring packing and amortized PU bootstrapping. Um, so I want to remind, remind everyone, all the attendees again, that uh, if you have questions, you can sort of type into the Q&A interface. Um, um, uh, take it away. All right. Um, so thank you, Vinod, very much for the introduction, as well as all of the other workshop organizers. Um, thank you to everyone on Zoom for sticking around for the last talk. Uh, so, right, I'll be talking about joint work with my advisor, Daniele, on uh, speeding up few bootstrapping. Um, so I guess, yeah, before we get into it, I sort of want to give you an idea of where we're going. Um, so we'll be presenting a new FAST algorithm uh, for bootstrapping uh, about linearly many um, uh, ciphertexts of the form output by the homomorphic NAND gate of the few homomorphic encryption scheme. Um, that Alaria mentioned, some other people have mentioned as well, um, that was presented by uh, Leo and Daniele. So um, to be a little bit more specific, uh, for uh, each of these uh, ciphertexts, we'll have to spend about um, lambda to the epsilon, many homomorphic operations uh, for the refreshing procedure, where again, lambda is a security parameter and um, epsilon is some sort of constant um, you can take to be less than or equal to a half. Um, and uh, notably, this is a, a savings of almost a linear factor over a homomorphic encryption schemes from similar assumptions. Um, where when I say similar assumptions, I'm, I'm comparing to other homomorphic encryption schemes where um, security is based on the hardness of some lattice problem or approximating some lattice problem to within polynomial approximation factors. Uh, this is an important sort of distinction to make um, because if we're willing to make somewhat stronger assumptions or like, take larger parameters, uh, there, there do already exist uh, fully homomorphic encryption schemes that have polylog uh, like per gate homomorphic operations, uh, but they, they require uh, assuming hardness of, uh, quasi, uh, of approximating these lattice problems within quasi polynomial factors. So we're sort of comparing ourselves to the, the polynomial regime here. We also have to make uh, an additional assumption, um, you can hopefully folks can see my cursor, um, which is circular security. And this is pretty common for fully homomorphic encryption schemes, since to perform this bootstrapping operation that we'll be talking about in a minute, we'll need to hand over encryptions of our secret key to some sort of untrusted party. Um, so we're assuming that this isn't going to compromise security. So that's sort of where we're going. So Jessica, the, yeah. the trade-off is, uh, is that instead of polylog, you get uh, lambda to the epsilon uh, for some epsilon. And uh, on the other hand, you have polynomial assumptions as opposed to quasi-polynomial, right? So the, I'm sorry? The, 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 the advantage is that you have polynomial assumptions as opposed to quasi-polynomial, uh, yeah. like just for example. But uh, on the other hand, you, 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 the, the amortized cost is the lambda to the epsilon as opposed to polylog lambda. Yes, that's, that's correct. Sounds good. Yeah, so we're, yeah, we're getting sublinear. Um, we're not getting uh, all the way down to the polylog, um, but we, we make weaker assumptions. So that's sort of the, the trade-off. And the epsilon somehow, it affect, you know, it comes up somewhere else in the, you know, something gross with epsilon probably. Yeah, exactly. So Sorry. we'll get into that when we talk about like how we're actually gonna be performing the bootstrapping. Um, okay. There are some trade-offs that you can make um, between let's say like error and efficiency for different choices of epsilon, but it'll always be some sort of constant, okay. um, yeah. less than equal to that. Thanks for the, the clarifying questions. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm not gonna bother with uh, defining a fully homomorphic encryption since I think that's been covered pretty well by the, the previous speakers. So I'm just gonna sort of launch right into um, specifically the few homomorphic encryption scheme as well as few bootstrapping. Um, and after we've talked about that, since we're sort of taking this as a starting point um, for, our, for our new bootstrapping algorithm, we'll, we'll go into yeah, what's, what's new in this paper. Uh, so Leo and Daniele give a, a very fast homomorphic NAND gate um, that uh, takes, takes as input LWE encryptions. So here's the uh, LWE that we all know and love. Uh, so uh, it's sort of relevant to point out that here I'm, I'm parameterizing by T, which is our plain text modulus space. Uh, you, you often think of M as being uh, you know, the bits, zero or one, in which case T is equal to two. And, 
Uh, so we're sort of scaling up our message by this factor. A uh, few will need to, to tweak this a little bit, uh, but everything's pretty much pretty much standard. Um, and this, this few NAND gates will take in encryptions of, of two bits. And again, we have sort of a, a plain text modulus of, of four here, but you should again still just think of M0 and M1 as being bits. And we'll output uh, a, an LW encryption of the result of this NAND gate um, under the plain text modulus of two. Uh, and I wanted to sort of show just the, the actual um, formula for this NAND gate, not because I think that we should all like stare at this and convince ourselves that it, uh, it actually computes the NAND uh, to within some sort of error that's tolerated by the encryption scheme, uh, but just to sort of emphasize that this is an extremely fast and lightweight operation, um, especially in terms of homomorphic operations. This is just you know, a couple of negations and additions of, of vectors and, and dimensions and uh, integers mod key. Uh, so we can reform exactly one of these uh, NAND operations um, before we have to start worrying about error, right? So we've sort of approximately computed NAND here. So we've introduced some error in our computation and we've also added the error terms um, of our ciphertexts. And so we're, we're gonna see error growth and we'll, we'll need to do something to, to reduce this so we can continue performing our, our NAND gates on the results. Uh, should come as no surprise that uh, we'll be doing bootstrapping to, to remove this error. So bootstrapping is a really cool idea introduced by Chen in 2009. And the, the basic idea is that we're just going to homomorphically evaluate the decryption function. Um, to be a little bit more specific about this, um, since we are going to be giving sort of an explicit bootstrapping scheme, uh, our decryption function is a, a function sort of, of of two inputs, right? So it takes in a secret key and a ciphertext. And often in non-homomorphic encryption, we'll sort of think of this as being like a partially applied function where it's already been applied to the, uh, the key as an input. And so it just remains to like take a, a ciphertext to compute decryption. But we're, uh, for the purposes of homomorphic evaluation, going to uh, partially apply in uh, the, the other order. So we're going to sort of partially apply the decryption function to a ciphertext, and then we'll take in a key as argument. Um, and this will be the, the function that we want to homomorphically evaluate. So then the like, sort of syntax of a homomorphic evaluation function will give us that, uh, if we you know, give us input this function, as well as some encryptions of the key material that we've used to encrypt the ciphertext, uh, that the results should be a valid encryption of uh, this function applied to its inputs and therefore the encryption of our ciphertext, right? So what does this mean? This means that we get a new fresh ciphertext um, that's still a valid encryption of M but with reduced error. Um, it is reduced error if the error overhead for this uh, homomorphic uh, evaluation of the decryption function is actually lower than the, the error for the, the plain text we took as input. Okay, uh, so in order for this to work out, we are going to need some sort of homomorphic encryption scheme uh, that's powerful enough to evaluate LWB decryption, again, without exceeding its own um, sort of error threshold, right? It's not going to help us at all if we uh, remove, you know, we sort of perform this decryption, but then we end up with an encryption that, that doesn't guarantee correctness um, of, of the of decryption with high probability. So um, few does this. They show how to use the, um, the homomorphic encryption scheme of Gentry, Sahai, and Waters, GSW, uh, to encode the results of these homomorphic NAND gates into um, sort of a cryptographic register, which they call like a homomorphic accumulator. And we'll use these accumulators to evaluate uh, LW decryption. So I just want to like draw a little cartoon about what this is going to look like, because um, it can sort of give us an idea maybe of uh, some, some concerns that we're going to have uh, when we try to speed up this bootstrapping process. So uh, we have two LWE ciphertexts uh, with sort of moderate error. I've tried to indicate how. Uh, how much error is inherent in the ciphertext with the intensity of this red color. So we perform our NAND gate and we get a very noisy LW ciphertext with uh, encoding the result. Now to refresh the ciphertext, we're going to uh, first encode it into a noiseless uh, homomorphic accumulator. And again, this is based on the GSW scheme. And uh, we're also going to have to play with some 
um, accumulators in coding uh, our, our key that we used to encrypt the, the ciphertext that we're refreshing. And we can use these registers to, um, to uh, evaluate, uh, or we, we can sort of like process these registers to end up with encryptions of if every term is the inner product that we need to compute for decryption. So we'll just you know, subtract off these terms uh, from uh, the, the register that's holding our, our ciphertext value. Right? In this process, we introduce some error into the sort of outer layer of decryption. We do this for every entry of the inner product. And now we have a somewhat noisy uh, register that's uh, encrypting um, the, the term sort of like B minus A dot S, right, in, in LWU encryption. Uh, so these registers will also support um, the scaling and rounding operation uh, that we'll need to perform for LWU decryption. And they also support a ciphertext extraction operation so that we can um, get from this, uh, this accumulator and LWE ciphertext with um, noise that's gonna be comparable to the, the noise in the GSW encryption. So this is great. So now we have an LWE ciphertext with lower error of the results. Um, we can continue performing NANDs on, on this ciphertext, keep on bootstrapping after every NAND and we have a fully homomorphic encryption scheme. And again, this is gonna be sort of contingent on um, the, the error not growing too much over this whole um, you know, bootstrapping process. Uh, if we have very large uh, error overhead in bootstrapping, then we'll need to take a much larger ratio um, of sort of like our, our modulus to error. Uh, and so this is sort of where the, the stronger assumptions that we might need to make come into play. We might need to take larger parameters to be guaranteed the, the same level of security. Uh, so Jessica, a quick question. Yeah. You know, you, you said, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the bootstrapping process, it takes uh, two mod four ciphertexts and converts it to a mod two ciphertext, or rather the, the pre-bootstrapping step, right? The nano yes. step. So, so, and then you take that, which is very noisy ciphertext is what comes out of it. Then you take it, put it into this GSW bootstrapping process and out comes a mod four ciphertext of the result. Is that yeah. right? Yes. Okay, and then you do this again and again. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So th thank you again for the the clarifying question. Um, we'll be we'll be able to extract from this a an LGB ciphertext of the appropriate form, um, with yeah the, the sort of error bound that we need to be able to perform this homomorphic NAND gate, and as well the proper the proper plain text modulus. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so as an overview, few gives this fast homomorphic NAND gate. That's just you know additions of LWU ciphertext or negations and additions. Uh, we also show how to build these homomorphic accumulators from the GSW homomorphic encryption scheme. Uh, bootstrapping uh, in in few takes like sort of quasi linear many operations on these homomorphic accumulators, uh, and only induces polynomial error overhead. So we're in sort of polynomial error regime, which is great. Uh, so we want to do better than this, right? We want to get down to sublinear many uh, homomorphic accumulator operations. Um, and an issue you can see if we just try to do this for a single ciphertext is that there's really no way around looking at every single entry of um, that inner product, right? We need to compute an inner product between our secret key um, and the ciphertext mask A to be able to perform decryption. And so um, we sort of yeah, have to have to perform n of these uh, homomorphic operations, and that sort of motivates uh, our approach, which is uh, parallel bootstrapping. Right, so we're just going to try to amortize this cost of bootstrapping um, over uh, about linearly many ciphertexts, and that's how we'll be able to get uh, again like sublinear amortized uh, homomorphic complexity. So I guess I'll stop and sort of take any questions that people have might have thus far before. We go into what's new. Or we'll go into what's new. Uh, so Jessica, one yep. question to get it clarified. Um, so the ciphertexts, they're all ragged ciphertexts, right? Uh, um, ciphertexts in the scheme are ragged ciphertexts. The GSW only happens in the encryption of the secret key, and then you know that so you work with it during bootstrapping, and then it comes back to Regev, and then so on and so forth, right? Yes. Um, and 
I see. And uh, uh -huh, uh -huh, okay. And, and you're probably gonna sort of make this ring ring LW is ciphertext or or not really. Oh uh, yeah, that's exactly where we're going. Yes. Uh, like which one? There are two choices, right? Either the uh, Ragib ciphertext could become ring LW or the GSW could become uh, ring. Yeah. Great. So, uh, so I will just move on to the next slide, which is ring packing. Um, so yes, the, the regev ciphertexts are going to become uh, RLWE. But hold, hold on a second, you know, just answer your question. So the, um, so and th this is common to, you know, a few TFHG and so on. So the encryption scheme is just regev. So that's always the case. That's how you encrypt your bits. And GSW is used only inside the bootstrapping procedure. Now, GSW usually is based on LWE, and a few introduce the special uh, variant of GSW, which uses uh, ring LWE. But mm -hmm. again, so this is just uh, internally mm -hmm. at the bootstrapping yeah. procedure. And that's also similar to the type of ring GSW accumulators used uh, in the TFHE. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now there is one more use of ring LWE, and this will be ring LWE, not ring, ring GSW, which is yeah, what yeah. Uh, uh, she will introduce now, and yeah, that's, that's specific to the amortization. Got it. Yeah, that's what I was asking. Yeah. Yeah. One more question. Uh, mm -hmm. This is this is Shai. Um, can you use also this... Uh, PVW type of packing where you sort of do LWE but you use many secret keys to encrypt many secrets? Um, so so we're, we're just going to use um, uh, a single sort of like packing key. Uh, so we're gonna do something that's essentially like a variant of key switching um, to, to take the, um, sort of like let's say uh, D, let's say like order D here where D is gonna be like the dimension of the, the ring that we're going to pack into. Um, take that many ciphertexts and you'll just end up with an RLWE encryption of the, the bits that were encrypted by the LWE scheme. Did that answer your question? Yeah, but uh, there is... Let me answer it. So, yeah. uh, so what you're suggesting is something that is useful to, uh, for compression to get a smaller ciphertext. Now, that's not enough. So the bootstrapping, this amortized bootstrapping that Jessica is going to describe also requires some algebraic structure in the ciphertext. So you cannot just replace this ring GSW, ring LWE packing with a PVW packing. I see. It's not just the compressing. In fact, the primary reason to do this packing is to amortize the operations and get better algorithms. OK, thank you. All right, thanks. Um, any more questions before I proceed? Jessica, so there is a question in the Q&A, which mm -hmm. uh, I think I can answer that. Oh, OK. Um, feel free to yeah, interrupt if, if I should yeah, respond to anything. OK, so, right, so we, we have um, our uh, D LWA ciphertext that we can um, presume that it just come out of some sort of homomorphic NAND gate, uh, a la few. And now we want to pack them into a single RLWE ciphertext, right? So uh, we define this, uh, this sort of subroutine pack, uh, which takes uh, the collection of ciphertexts as well as um, a, a special packing key, which will be you know, RLWE encryptions uh, under some new polynomial key Z of uh, you know, both key material. Um, I won't actually throw up the, the particular computation because I feel like if you're familiar with packing techniques, it's sort of intuitive, you have an idea of what we'll be doing. And if, if you're not, then I don't think the, the algebra is particularly informative. Um, but the idea is that um, the, you know, the output of this, uh, this routine will be a single RLWE ciphertext, right? Where we're in a sort of standard, standard ring where we should assume that D is some sort of power of two so that this is actually a ring of integers. Um, of some cyclotomic field, and uh, the, the correctness property that you would expect uh, will hold, right? So if we perform RLWE encryption using the key that we used uh, to encrypt the values of our packing key, that will end up uh, with a sort of you know, noisy message where this message is now a polynomial, the coefficients of which are just the, the bits that we are encrypting with our, our regf style LWE encryptions. Great. So now that we've done this packing, um, 
we, we still need to do bootstrapping, right? So we still need to homomorphically compute decryption. Um, but now rather than needing to compute, say, um, D of these uh, inner products, we now need to compute a single polynomial multiplication, as well as the you know, sort of like uh, subtraction, scaling, rounding steps. Um, but we were shown how to do these already um, by uh, Daniele and Leo. Uh, so really it just sort of remains for us to show how to efficiently do this homomorphic polynomial multiplication. Right? And we have uh, D to the one plus epsilon homomorphic operations sort of like at our disposal to meet our goal of um, you know, sort of like lambda to the epsilon uh, amortized operations uh, over all the ciphertexts. And so this looks pretty good, right? Like we know that we can perform polynomial multiplication and, and log n. So it seems like we have uh, some, some wiggle room here. Uh, but again, if we want to sort of use these homomorphic accumulators, that's going to, to limit the number or the kinds of operations that we can perform, um, as well as the way that we can associate those operations. So I'm sort of talk about those restrictions a little bit and um, talk about how they sort of inform the, the algorithm design here. So what are the atomic accumulator operations that we're allowed to assume? So we can initialize an accumulator with some sort of a known plain text integer mod Q. We can also increment an accumulator, again, by some sort of known integer. Uh, we can add two, uh, two accumulators. So we, we need not know either value in this case, um, but we yeah, get a, a correct accumulator of the result of the addition. And we can perform extraction. As I mentioned before, we can extract from some sort of accumulator an LWE uh, ciphertext of that same value. And again, um, uh, of, of the form needed to continue performing these, uh, these few NAND gates. And there is uh, sort of an additional consideration, which is that for this uh, accumulator addition, that association of our inputs will actually matter. So what do I mean by this? Uh, so let's say we want to add two accumulators with error like beta zero and beta one respectively. Uh, I will end up with an accumulator that has uh, error increased by a, a factor D, where again, D is sort of, uh, about D, uh, where D is sort of like the, the security parameter. Um, and it's asymmetric in the, the two inputs, right? You can see here that the, the error that we get at the end uh, sort of just like hits, let's say, the, our second input to, to addition. Um, so uh, this means that if we have, you know, let's say like two accumulators coming in, we know that one is significantly noisier than the other. We want to pass the noisiest one in as sort of like the first argument and the less noisy one is the second. Uh, so in terms of structure of circuits, that, that's going to sort of limit uh, the recursive depth of any polynomial multiplication algorithm that we can consider. Uh, so if we have something uh, that's, that's highly recursive where like sort of every addition gate is taking in uh, as, as both of its inputs, the result of a, a gate from a previous layer, uh, then we're going to end up with error that's um, exponential in the depth of the circuit. So if we have some sort of log n depth, uh, log n depth uh, circuit for computing uh, this polynomial multiplication, we're gonna end up with error that's quasi-polynomial and that's not what we're aiming for, right? We wanna stay solidly in the polynomial regime. So we want circuits to sort of look, look more like this whenever possible. Uh, so questions about anything so far? Uh, Jessica, there's a question in the Q and A. Maybe you can read it out. And, uh... There we go. Ah, okay, so from this, uh, is it possible to modify the accumulator uh, to change the ring that is used in GSW? Um, so I guess I, I would sort of want to ask a clarifying question. Um, do you mean, uh, like, should, can we use a non-power of two cyclotomic within the GSW based accumulator? Is that what you mean? Um, Perhaps you can continue and uh, okay. the question offline. Um, I will sort of uh, say like preemptively. Uh, so there, there are some details I'm sort of uh, hiding under the rug a little bit. Um, so I, I, maybe that's sort of what this question is about. I'm not sure. Um, okay, great. Uh, so, um, so you're gonna your uh, the ring that you're gonna want to use for your uh, homomorphic. Uh, accumulator is going to sort of be be tied to the modulus that you were using for your 
um, like LWE ciphertext. Um, since uh, if you're all familiar with, with how these sort of accumulators are going to work, we're going to be encoding the, um, the, the values for accumulators in the exponent of these, uh, um, these ciphertexts. And so um, and we're sort of going to be using um, let's see, like using this dimension uh, as a sort of like uh, you're sort of using like like powers of x um, to to represent like different values modular q, and so we won't have like total flexibility in picking uh, picking the range for the GSW accumulators. Um, it's also sort of um, maybe uh, important to point out that I've I've have swapped some details under the rug. Uh, we won't actually be packing into um, power of two cyclotomics um, for, for reasons that I can sort of refer to later when we start looking at the algorithm. So we'll actually be using power of three cyclotomics. This changes very, very little. Instead of making, uh, like it just adds a little bit of, uh, of a pain doing the error analysis, but um, doesn't really change anything structurally. So I just went with power of two for simplicity of presentation. Okay. Um, so moving on. Um, so yeah, what does this mean for uh, candidates for polynomial multiplication schemes? So the like fast Fourier transform is going to be right out, right? This is a log n depth sort of uh, computation. So that's going to give us quasi polynomial error, even though it's going to sort of meet our requirements for a number of homomorphic operations. Um, on the other hand, if we try to be you know less clever about how we compute a Fourier transform and just sort of do like a, a straightforward computation of, of all of those sums, uh, we'll stay within the polynomial error regime, but we'll end up having to perform something like quadratic number of homomorphic operations. And so we'll get no savings for our attempt at amortization. And the same thing holds for say like naive polynomial multiplication, right? We'll end up with polynomial error, but this uh, quadratic number of operations. So what we're gonna do instead is um, something that sort of combines all ideas from, from all of these algorithms. Um, so we'll be using uh, an Nussbaumer transform uh, followed by slow polynomial multiplication. Uh, so at least going into this, this transform was new to me. So I'll assume it's maybe new for, for other people. Um, and sort of give a first, a, a first pass sort of high level description of what this transform is going to allow us to do before I get into how it does it. So it's going to operate on elements of, of this ring, right? Just good, this is where our, um, our ciphertexts are living. Um, and it's gonna be parameterized by some epsilon, right? So uh, again, you can think of epsilon as being less than or equal to a half. And uh, further, we're going to require that D to the epsilon must divide D, the dimension of our ring. Uh, so with epsilon fixed, we can define some second ring on our prime of smaller dimension, right? Specifically smaller by a factor d to the epsilon. Um, and this form of a transform is going to allow us to sort of reduce the task of uh, multiplying in our first ring r to the task of uh, two, performing two, to the, two d to the epsilon multiplications in this smaller ring r prime. Um, so should we like be at all excited about this? So if we, you know, if, if we're performing these multiplications via something like, uh, you know, like a slow and naive multiplication algorithm, uh, right, then, then multiplications in this ring uh, will take, you know, uh, d to the 2 minus 2 epsilon. Uh, so since we've lost this 2 epsilon, uh, we should be happy kind of to, to eat this factor of, of d to the epsilon, right? We've still reduced the um, total number of operations required to perform the, the polynomial multiplication. Uh, moreover, this is, uh, you can perform this recursively, right? So if we're reducing multiplication in one ring to multiplication in the second ring with a similar structure, then we can just apply this again, right? And uh, this will bottom out after uh, one over epsilon, like actually actually one over epsilon minus one, but uh, order one over epsilon many recursions. And so this is gonna give a constant depth, right? Which is what we were aiming for. If we have a constant recursive depth, then we're gonna end up in this polynomial error regime. So, uh, we're actually bottom out in this ring, our double prime, right? Where our elements are now, uh, our polynomials are now of uh, dimension d to the epsilon. Um, so now we're gonna, if we go all the way down to the bottom, so we'll end up with two to the one over epsilon, uh, d to the one minus epsilon, many multiplications in this small ring. 
So, you know, we'll end up with uh, something like d to the one plus epsilon many operations to compute this, compute all those multiplications. And the transform itself um, takes the same, like, you know, on the order of the same number of or operations to compute. Uh, so this is going to, this is going to be our approach, right? We're, this is what we're going to use to do our uh, homomorphic polynomial multiplication. So let's talk a bit about how this actually works. I'll just leave these up here for reference, right? These are just the definitions of like R and R prime, or R prime sort of the ring that we get after one uh, layer of the transform. And we're going to consider uh, performing this transform on some polynomial A. Um, I see that I'm out of time, so I'll try to try to speed up. Um, Jessica, you can take a few more minutes. Um, okay. Thanks. Okay, so um, so how does this, this like map work? Uh, so I just want to give an example. So it'll be concrete and fix epsilon uh, to be equal to a half, and let's just say d is sixteen for for purposes. So we have our polynomial here, and uh, there's a, a purely representational map. There's no actual computation involved in this. Uh, where we sort of introduce a new variable y, right? Where we're uh, identifying y with x to the d to the epsilon. And now we just rewrite a as a bivariate polynomial in both x and y, right? So um, we, we sort of peel off all terms that are here that are uh, congruent to, to zero mod uh, d to the epsilon and similarly congruent to one and uh, two and three, right? So, so we now have this beautiful bivariate polynomial. Uh, and now we can consider performing a DFT on the polynomial just in X, right? Uh, so if we're again, just considering a polynomial, this was a polynomial in X, well, that's going to be a DFT of dimension two d to the epsilon. Um, and we can perform this, this uh, DFT because uh, in this ring, we have um, Y as, or Y to the D to the one minus two epsilon will be um, the appropriate principal root of unity. Um, and in our concrete case where epsilon is equal to a half, this is just uh, y, right? So y is gonna be the principal root of unity uh, that we need in, uh, in the ring to, to compute this, uh, this transform. Uh, moreover, multiplications by this root of unity uh, are just going to be uh, negative rotations of the coefficient vector, right? So multiplying by y, um, once we hit to y to the d to the one minus epsilon, which is just negative one. Uh, and so we're essentially just rotating our coefficient vector and negating overflow terms. So this can be done efficiently and doesn't involve any sort of like multiplication by scalar values. So after we perform this DFT, we still need to perform the pointwise multiplication step. Um, and this is gonna require, right? So the output is we're gonna end up with two to d to the epsilon polynomials that now have degree uh, less than d to the one minus epsilon. Uh, and again, as I said, we, we do this recursively, right? So we end up with a whole bunch of polynomials, um, but now they're, they're much smaller, something like d to the epsilon, and we can use naive multiplication because uh, now we can, we can happily eat that, that quadratic factor um, that, that we'll get from the multiplication. Okay, so uh, any questions so far? Um, so I have, uh, again, like highlighted some details, uh, namely when I talked about the, these um, sort of homomorphic, uh, these, I guess the accumulator operations, right? I, I specifically, the, there wasn't scalar multiplication. Um, and since I'm out of time, I'm sort of just gonna like breeze through this because this will probably be familiar to a number of people. Um, but the way that we're going to sort of encrypt or to, to compute these, um, these multiplications that are gonna be required for the slow multiplication stuff at the end is to take advantage of the fact that, okay, well, we, uh, we know what S is, or right? uh, so I guess rather I should say like we um, can encrypt since the, I guess the um, user of the scheme will, will know what S is. They can sort of provide some extra information um, to their untrusted uh, person to whom they're delegating their computation that will allow this person to perform the, the necessary scalar multiplications. Um, specifically, we'll not just give uh, handover as our bootstrapping key, uh, accumulators storing the values um, of the, the output of this transform, we'll give them the output of this transform multiplied by all powers of two, right? That will sort of let them reassociate uh, 
the operation that is sort of taking the binary representation of A and taking its inner product with a, a vector of increasing powers of two. Um, so that now we can just take sums of accumulators uh, since all of these A sub Js will just be binary values, zeros or ones. Right, so that's sort of how we're getting around the fact that we don't really have scalar multiplication as an atomic operation. Great. Um, so sort of wanna, we sort of got, you know, a little bit into this, um, this transform, we wanna back back up to sort of consider why we did all this. So again, our, our starting point was this a few homomorphic NAND that we, and we wanted to be able to refresh these in a more efficient way. So we will pack D on the outputs of these homomorphic NAND gates into a single RLW ciphertext, uh, perform this sort of Nussbaumer transform, and then at the end, we'll perform the pointwise multiplications uh, via some sort of naive um, or slow multiplication algorithm. Um, and this will again give us the, the desired number of homomorphic accumulator operations once we consider this amortized over um, all of the ciphertexts being refreshed. And then the remaining steps of bootstrapping just sort of follow from the results um, in the DM15 paper. Right, so we have to perform some you know, subtractions, some, uh, some rounding and extraction, but that's that already exists for us because we're using these homomorphic accumulators. And again, because we only had a constant recursive depth for this algorithm, we only induced a polynomial error overhead. And so we get security based on you know, the hardness of approximating these last problems to within polynomial factors. There are some open questions. Um, Notably, it would be great to get some sort of implementation or optimization of this. There are a number of parameters. Uh, there are some interesting trade-offs between different choices of epsilon, right? So if we take a smaller epsilon, we get larger error growth because we have a larger recursive depth, but we also end up with smaller polynomials at the end. And so uh, that slow multiplication stuff will go much faster. Um, uh, there's also the question of is there is there some sort of like happy way that we can get, still get polylog? We can actually like drive it all the way down to polylog for get complexity um, without exceeding this like, polynomial error. Um, it's not clear how you would do this with um, just taking different parameters for the, the Nussbaumer transform. Um, so I'm not really sure uh, how to, to proceed with that. Another interesting one question um, is the security of RLWE uh, with specifically binary secrets. Um, I sort of skipped over a key switching step that, that has to happen um, at the, the end of all of this, um, but we can actually get rid of that step entirely if we could assume uh, security of our LWU's binary secrets. Um, and lastly, like, can this be, can any of these techniques be applied to um, TFAG, right? So the, uh, the few scheme and TFAGs share, share a lot of um, structural similarities. And so it, it might be reasonable to think that we can do something similar to, to speed up uh, bootstrapping in, in this setting. Yeah. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you again for sticking around to the end. I'm happy to, to take any questions. Yeah. Um, just, I have three questions, but yeah, just yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> When the time comes. Oh, sounds good, you should ask. Uh, and there is a question in the Q&A and uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, so I, I think you've already answered the first question, but I'll, I'll still ask it. Uh, so uh, about the applicability of this approach to TFHG, and, and I think you said that it's basically uh, the same technique can be applied in, in it. And it looks like there is no special constraint that prevents one just uh, to, uh, from applying it to the different type of accumulator that's used in the TFHG cases. Jessica, is that yeah, basically what you're understanding? Um, yeah, I, I would. I want to think about it like a little bit more, but again, because the the accumulator structure is you know identical, um, essentially, and so I don't. Yeah, I don't see why uh, TFHG at least couldn't support these operations. Um, the question is, yeah, I guess maybe what do you get out of it? Um, that would be the the thing I want to think more about. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jessica. So the second question, uh, so the approach that you use uh, uh, basically for packing uh, 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 for this DFT-like operation, uh, how does it compare with, let's say, collapsed FFT that was used for CKKS bootstrapping, uh, so in the paper by uh, Hao, Ilaria, and uh, Yang Su, just, 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 I mean, I think conceptually there are some similarities uh, there where they use just to they replace FFT with a constant basically depth computation. Just just wondering more. I mean, how how, how uh, close this uh, basically not power transform with a uh, collapse FFT that was used? 
Oh, um, so I, I'm actually, I don't think I'm able to answer that question. Um, I'll sort of maybe see if, if my advisors hung around and is better than a better position to answer this. Um, but I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not. So yeah, no, I, I'm not sure there is much, uh, the two things have much in common. Uh, I, I mean, except possibly for using uh, the same algorithm for two different uh, reasons, but I think it's, uh, yeah, it's quite different, but it may be worth a closer uh, look. So regarding the first question about the TFHG, I mean, there's a difference. So, so this algorithm, as soon as you do a, a FFT or an Asbamer transform uh, uh, network with more than two layers, then you do need a full uh, uh, ring GSW accumulator. You cannot get away with a optimized, um, you know, external product because one layer needs to feed to the next layer of the FFT mm -hmm. computation. So if the first layer is computing results which are simple uh, uh, ring LWE ciphertexts, then they cannot be used as input for the following layer. So it's only in the last layer of the computation that you can use the external product optimization. So that's one difference. And uh, so I, I don't know what you mean uh, by TFHG versus few in some sense. That uh, Jinx, Jinx have... versus AP bootstrapping. That's that's really the question is, uh, let's say the instantiation of few with Jinx uh, bootstrapping. Yeah, so in some sense, this is a completely different bootstrapping. So the bootstrapping here is uh, uh, different. Uh, it's doing this homomorphic uh, FFT computation. So it's not clear. It, it, to me, it looks more like few because it is using the full GSW accumulator, and it's not clear how to use the um, how to use the MOOC computation, the switch. Uh, uh, technique from TFHG. So, but uh, the bootstrapping algorithm itself, of course, you can apply it to TFHG ciphertext because they are identical. I mean, the, the, the ciphertext and also the way you compute the basic gates, uh, FHG, a uh, few or TFHG, they are essentially the, the same. But yeah, it's not clear how to use the external product uh, technique because uh, uh, except in the trivial case where you do only one layer, but if you do only one layer, then uh, yeah, it's... Um, uh, yeah, Sorry, Daniela, may I comment on that? Uh, just a little comment. Uh, I, I, Jessica, sorry, Ilaria here. Uh, so Daniela was saying that um, the, the, the external product uh, MUX uh, maybe cannot be used, but of course in TFHG you can define also a MUX with the internal GSW times GSW product. So if this is really a limitation, this operation can be defined. But of course, I, I didn't check enough detail to tell you if the external product could still be used. I trust Daniela on this. No, that's correct. No, no, no. What Ilaria says is correct. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, basically, what you're doing is to take few, then uh, you optimize, you are removing uh, uh, all the rows except one to make it more efficient, uh, and that's TFHG. And then uh, when you're doing this extension to produce uh, ring GSW ciphertext at the end, basically you're going back to few. You're taking all those extra rows and putting back in. So what are, what are you doing? It's, uh, I think conceptually can be thought as uh, doing and then undoing the TFHG optimization. So I'm not sure if it's something that is uh, distinctively, uh, you know, different from just using uh, you in the first place uh, uh, without going through TFHG at all. I see, I see, I see. It was, uh, it would be nice to to get more into the details and, and see effectively. Yeah, yeah, but thank worth, you for the remark, yes. Yeah, yeah, it may be worth it to check in the details, but so this, this is my guess that uh, so mm -hmm. what you are describing uh, is, uh, so is basically two things uh, done in a row that basically bring you back to the original uh, to the original starting point. Uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. It was just a comment on the MUX gate. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> you know, can I still ask the last question, the third question, or is it, I mean, do I have time? It's a shorter question. Uh, yeah, so the third question is uh, more on the practicality of, of this technique. Uh, do, uh, uh, I, I assume there is uh, no implementation 
uh, or I mean, or maybe there are some estimates just to get an idea on the concrete uh, benefits uh, in, let's say, amortized uh, time of using this technique versus, let's say, uh, plain FHE. I mean, at, at, at what basically at the bit level. Just wondering what what's the what's the kind of practical. Sure. Yeah, this, this is a good question. I, I wish I had like a a better answer to give you. So we we did do an implementation, sort of just for like a. Um, uh, our, you know, proof of concept type of thing. So, you know, like sanity checks if this works. Um, and uh, I made uh, no effort whatsoever to optimize it. And so unfortunately I ended up with something where the runtime was actually for, for parameters that you would take for, you know, reasonably take for, for security, um, runtimes that were comparable to just running few, right? So mm -hmm. you didn't actually see um, these sort of asymptotics kick in. Um, but I think there's there's certainly a lot of low-hanging fruit in, in terms of implementation. Um, so there's uh, there are again like different choices of epsilon. Um, you can even like consider to some extent uh, if, if you want to like get really into it, like uh, picking different epsilons at, at different levels of recursion uh, rates. Like you you don't want to take it to be um, uh, like say like a function of the dimension of the current depth because then you'll end up with right, a depth that depends on um, on d and so again you'll cause a polynomial error but you could maybe like switch to a different constant or something some some ways so I think there's a lot that you could do um, to to improve it but there there exists an implementation it's not a particularly impressive one at the moment. But it was no slower than the original few. So in some sense, uh, I mean, there was no concrete, uh, uh, you know, benefit. Uh, so in some sense, uh, you can think of it as being a borderline uh, practical. I mean, there's no point in using it because you don't get any benefit. But uh, I think it's uh, promising. It seems that uh, if with some more effort, uh, either on the coding side uh, or uh, algorithmic ideas, uh, it might become a, a useful technique to substantially improve the amortized complexity of the few slash TFH bootstrapping. So, um, so, 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 so guys, I, I assume uh, you guys thought, so, so the whole question boils down to whether there is a circuit for FFT uh, that has low lopsided depth, let's call it that. Right? Yeah, like a skew circuit, yeah. Um, I assume you guys really sort of uh, thought about it and they, you know, is there, a, is there any kind of lower bound, you know, um, there are no circuit lower bounds, but uh, maybe <laughs> sort of like an arithmetic. Uh, uh, is there reason to believe that you can't do better than this uh, this uh, d to the epsilon? Is what I'm asking. Um, so I, I unfortunately don't have uh, particular evidence uh, one way or or the other. Sure. Um, again, uh, it's I mean it is sort of interesting, right? That if you if you try to like drag these things down to um, to am, am, yeah, like polylog amortized complexity that you seem to keep on being forced into um, some sort of quasi polynomial error regime. Um, and again, like there, uh, I at least thought about you know different ways that you could uh, perform um, this like recursion and the Nussbaumer transform. And there's there's no you know uh, uh, sort of if you, you know, treat epsilon as being some sort of like function rather than a constant. There's nothing that gets you there. Um, and I, it's, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure in terms of like just generally computing this polynomial multiplication. Um, uh, structurally, or right, how you do this in a, uh, in a sort of like skew circuit with modest like recursive depth, again, without, um, yeah, either ending up with like the Nussbaum transform that we ended up with, or, um, you know, if you have like a, just a completely skew circuit, something that's going to be like quadratically many operations. So I don't have a lower bound. That would be really interesting to, to get. Um, there's one more question in the uh, Q and A, which uh, maybe you can read it out. And, uh... Absolutely. Um, oh, it looks like there are, are two. I think, or one oh, was maybe. Wow. Well. Did it go? Um, oh, okay. So one just disappeared, <laughs> uh, and one is. Uh, can you say more about how to choose this point to change over from the Nussbaumer transform to um, to slow molds? Okay, and how it affects the error growth? Absolutely. Um, so again, this is going to be you know sort of a, a question of um, uh, what you take epsilon to be. Uh, so uh, it it seems reasonable. So if you don't care about about error growth at all, um, you know maybe you're just like happy to. 
uh, to stay in the, like, in the polynomial regime, you don't care about what polynomial you end up with, uh, then you, you really want to um, recurse as much as you possibly can, right? Which would be again, like one over epsilon because this is going to give you the smallest possible polynomials. We're performing this multiplication with a, a quadratic, um, quadratic time algorithm. And so, right, this is gonna uh, be sort of like the sticking point for the ultimate like, complexity of this algorithm. Um, so there's, yeah, there's, again, if you don't care about what polynomial you end up with, then there's no reason to not recurse to the bottom. Um, and again, like you sort of bottom out when you like lose that principal read of unity that you need to compute the transform. Um, so yeah, if you do care about error, if you say, oh, I particularly, you know, I, I want like a, a small polynomial, then okay, maybe you take epsilon to be larger, you can take epsilon to, to be a half, and then, you know, you end up with, um, you still save like a, a square root factor in your total complexity and you end up with lower error. Um, but it's it's not so impressive in terms of, you know, like these homomorphic operations are, they tend to be fairly cumbersome. And uh, really it seems like for most people, efficiency of, uh, of bootstrapping is sort of the primary concern. People are it seems, more or less happy to take on larger error to, to get that. Sounds good. Um, so we are way over time, uh, but, um, but let's thank Jessica again and all the speakers uh, today and all the speakers for the for the whole workshop uh, thanks for doing this in the in this unusual format uh, um, and thanks to all the attendees for sticking around let's thank Jessica once again yeah.